late delegations uh, that um, that have been presented to us, and uh, if Council so chooses, we can put a motion forward to uh, modify the uh, the agenda to allow those two, or to the Council. I would, I would make that motion. Oh, to allow. Mm -hmm. Okay. And any questions on that? Mm -hmm. All in favor? Okay, so that's carried. So the two late delegations we have are Mr. Dobbs and uh, Mr. Rivers, so you'll be at the end of it. So this takes us to five delegations tonight. You each get ten minutes, and um, and then with questions, it, it can get a little lengthy, so um, um, sometimes less is more. <laughs> so, um, well, and but, also we have that public hearing. Um, and we have a public hearing at 6.30 that if we are not finished this meeting, we will adjourn this meeting and, uh, and have the public hearing and then come back to it. So, all right, having said that, we have the first delegation, and uh, John Bowman from North Island College. John, the podium's yours. You have 10 minutes. And um, thank Council. Okay, uh, good evening, members of Council, your worship, and ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I am John Bowman, the president of North Island College, and uh, I appreciate you sharing a few minutes of your time with me this afternoon. I'm here to uh, give you a quick update on North Island College with a particular focus on our planning process for the development of our next strategic plan, Plan 2025. Before I get to that, I always like to start a presentation with a quick overview of the North Island College region, show the map of, of the island. We are North Island College, but also serve a big chunk of the central mainland coast, as you can see. One of the first questions I often get asked at events like this is, how are your enrollments at the college? How many students do you have? So I thought I'd just quickly digress and show you this chart, which uh, indicates how many students we have at each of our, our major centers. You'll see there in the center in the Comox Valley, we have over 4,000 students, headcount, and credit and non-credit programs. So why am I here? Um, basically for three reasons. To inform you about NIC's planning process, and more importantly, to invite you to participate and contribute to setting our path for the next five years. We also want to express our thanks to you, Council and the community, for the tremendous support that the College receives in the region for the work that we do together. So as I said, we uh, we are currently in the four, fifth and final year of our current strategic plan, termed Plan 2020, uh, developed in 2016 and will expire in, uh, in April of this coming year. And we've begun this year a process to develop a brand new strategic plan, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about what that entails. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with strategic plans. I won't read this to you, but basically it's going to provide our overall direction, focus on priorities and results that we want to treat before the, the college as a whole. It's a very straightforward structure. These are the parts of our plan. We receive a mandate and direction from the provincial government. We are a provincial government entity defined and uh, empowered through legislation, and they provide us with a mandate, and uh, our mission is about serving uh, this college region. We also uh, have a set of institutional values, those things that are fundamentally important to us, that we focus on, and uh, our vision for the future and our aspirations are, are supported by those values. Critically, the, the College Strategic Plan identifies our major priorities for the, the term of the plan, and those priorities will be supported by a number of goals uh, phrased in terms of specific results and changes that we want to accomplish. We'll also be focusing on how we report and assess on our progress in relation to the College Strategic Plan, so that will all be developed as part of this process going forward. Uh, just a quick refresher on our current priorities. We have lots of priorities. There are five that focus on what we do. Uh, I won't read them to you again, but uh, you can see they're uh, important and relevant to all of our communities. And we have four priorities that relate to uh, how we support our, our mission-critical priorities on the left-hand side of the slide. So these are components of the planning process. We've completed a major environmental scan our institutional research and planning staff have collected a, a huge wealth of information about demography, the environment, the economy, basically everything you could possibly want to know about the North Island College region, including the Comox Valley. And we're looking for issues and trends that will impact our institution uh, going forward. We've also uh, completed a process internally to look at our college values and guiding ideas and commitments. And from that, we will issue a set of statements uh, representing our, our, our key uh, values uh, and guiding ideas. And lastly, we've looked back at Plan 2020 and uh, done a review of our progress and identified where we have gaps 
in terms of the things that we set out to do four years ago. So those parts are completed. The parts that we are working on this fall and winter are these. We're going to be reviewing our mission, vision, and doing a refresh on those. We'll be engaging the community through a variety of uh, in processes, seeking student and uh, the public's input. That will support our priority study and goal development. And we're working on how we will assess and report on uh, our goals through key performance indicators. So how can you contribute and participate? Well, I encourage everyone to look at the college's website and uh, review our current plan in more detail. The environmental scan that's been produced is a uh, wealth of information not only for the college and for, but for other organizations. We will be launching uh, the 1st of September a major online strategic planning survey. We'll be seeking uh, all residents of the North Island region, including the Comox Valley, to contribute to uh, provide their perceptions of the college and, and how we're doing and what we should include in our, in our next plan. We'll be hosting in-person forums the first week of November. There'll be an invitation forthcoming, certainly to members of council. We'll be inviting the public and uh, look for that in email and on social media coming in, in September. And lastly, any ideas, suggestions that the community has, feel free to call or, or email me or anyone uh, at the college. So these you have in your package links to some of our key planning documents uh, uh, listed there. Our timeline is, uh, we're here in August. This is my first uh, community outreach to municipal councils. I'll also be meeting with others, regional boards and uh, school districts and other organizations in the coming weeks. And uh, we intend to have the whole process completed by April uh, next year when the college board, I hope, will uh, approve a new strategic plan for the college. Uh, just to conclude, I want to highlight a few things that are uh, current and uh, newsworthy in the Comox Valley for NIC. Uh, we are enjoying a period of, of growth and expansion thanks to the provincial government's support for new programming initiatives, health care, early childhood education, uh, Guacala language, and uh, I would be remiss if I didn't note that the Comox Valley Elder College is celebrating their 20th anniversary in September. We'll be uh, holding an event at the campus and uh, hope many of you will be able to attend. You may not know, uh, I think Council is aware that NIC is opening a footprint for the first time in the town of Comox. We'll be uh, leasing space at the former St. Joseph's Hospital to deliver health care and the child education program. On September 11th, we'll be holding an open house for the public to come in and see uh, how NIC will be uh, teaching out of the, the former St. Joseph's Hospital. Very excited about that. We're in the midst of a major renovation and expansion of our Discovery Hall building here on the campus. It's a $1.1 million expansion in addition. Uh, going to certainly provide more opportunities for providing high quality services to students. International education, certainly that has been a big success story for the Comox Valley. This year we expect to have 500 students uh, across the college region, about 400 here in, in Comox Valley. Uh, business programs, growth, success in terms of degree graduates. And uh, probably the biggest thing, the biggest thing that's going to happen to North Island College in the Comox Valley in the past 20 years at least will be the development of student housing at our, on our campus. We're currently developing a business case and uh, embarking on the design process, 468 student beds uh, on our campus in Courtney. Lastly, uh, we've been supported tremendously by the community through the North Island College Foundation for the expansion of our scholarships and bursaries program. College region-wide will be giving away more than a half million dollars. Uh, we expect about half of that to be to students in the Comox Valley this year. So I'll end on that. Uh, I'd be delighted to entertain any questions that uh, members have regarding the uh, college planning process or anything at all about NIC while I'm here. Well, thank you, John. Um, no, my son, he's just uh, finishing his fourth year at the business uh, program there, and he loves going to North Island College. And it's great that you know he can attend something like that, get a degree, and stay locally. So that's an important piece of it. So. Council, have any questions for Mr. Bond? I just did. Um, really pleased to see that you're having uh, student housing available. Two things that always cross our plate are housing mm -hmm. and then child care. And I see the um, you have an early childhood good education program opportunities expanding. Yes. Um, do you offer any child care on campus? We do. Uh, the Beaufort Child Care Society. Uh, we have. We have a child care center on the campus, which is operated by the society, independent but in partnership with the college. And we are in discussions with them now about the likelihood we want to expand. They'll need to expand. They have a long waiting list already. Uh, I've just recently learned that the provincial government is providing additional capital funding to support expansion facilities, so we'll be hoping to tap into that. But we, we're required, actually, to, to submit, as part of our business case, a plan for child care uh, with, in connection to the housing business case. And... Um, <clears throat> 
Assuming your, your student housing plans go ahead, as, as you're hoping, when would you start the building? Our, our, our tar target is to open in September 22. It's a 24-month process to build and open. So we're on track. Uh, we intend to submit our business case. We, we've engaged architects to do the initial schematic or indicative design work uh, this fall. The provincial government requires that level of detail in order to uh, pr provide them with cost certainty. We'll be uh, providing them with cost estimates for the project. Right now, we place it around $28 million, but the likelihood is that those numbers will move around as we get into the detailed design process. They're requiring a very high level of uh, energy efficiency and basically zero uh, impact in terms of uh, the, the environment. So that will drive costs up somewhat. But we're confident that things are going well. We get an approval early in 2020, in say January, February, that we'll build it and complete it, have it open for students in September of 2022. Okay, thank you. But I, I should qualify, we don't have government approval yet. It will be financed through a combination of grant and loan, but we're very optimistic. We're getting positive signals. and. We do, if we do our planning right, I think we'll get support. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> so uh, next we have uh, Diane Hawkins. Welcome, Diane, with uh, the Comox Valley uh, Chamber. Yep. Thank you. Um, I'm Diane Hawkins. I'm the CEO of the Comox Valley Chamber of Commerce, and I've been there for 15 years now. <laughs> I want to thank, uh, the, thank Council for the opportunity to speak to you. I'm not coming with anything serious. I'm coming to invite you to recognize and uh, perhaps give a letter of proclamation to the Chamber of Commerce in, in recognition of being 100 years in this community. The Comox Valley Chamber has worked very hard uh, over 100 years to see things, see changes in the valley and to work not just for the business community, but for the community as a whole. And so that's, that's what we're asking. So in 1919, we were the Courtney Comox Board of Trade, and the Board of Trade was initiated by businessmen and farmers in the valley. So you'll see on our certificate of incorporation, which is on our boardroom wall, I was um, fortunate enough when I started at the chamber to find this document, it's original, and have it framed. So it's in a big frame with our seal. And um, membership was eight dollars. It's not quite eight dollars anymore, as some of you will know. <laughs> uh, but there's names on there that many of you will recognize because they're street names in our valley. So Anderton, Idians, Willimar, McPhee, uh, Hereford. So there's there's a lot of history steeped in the Chamber of Commerce, and we've been working to put together a. Um, just a very small kind of history overview of what the Chamber's been doing in the last hundred years. It's not big, we're just going to make about probably 20 copies and give them to the museum just to commemorate that, hey, we've been here for a hundred years and we're kind of proud of it. It's kind of a big deal. And so we would like to ask that you give us a proclamation acknowledging the work and the business support and community support that the Chamber's provided in the Comox Valley. We have a letter from the regional district and we're approaching every council to ask that they that they recognize the chamber's um, input into our community and the building of our community. I'd also like to invite you to our celebration. So we're having a big celebration on September 28th and we're going to kick it off by recognizing some of our long-term members and that's an invitation only and some of you will have received an invitation. Um, we want to recognize long-standing members. So we have members that have been uh, members for 100 years. So Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce has been a member of the Chamber of Commerce for 100 years. So that's a really big deal. <laughs> and then we have Waypoint Insurance that's been a member for almost 50 years. So there's quite a, a variation uh, of members. We have 500 members in our community. And we, do, we continue to do a lot of advocacy work on behalf of business and, um, and our community. So we invite you to come to that, to our recognition ceremony. And then we have a big party happening at the Native Sons Hall. So we are hoping to pack it out, and we have the Time Benders going to dance us through the decades. So that should be a lot of fun. And if you don't know who the Time Benders are, they change costumes for every decade. So they're actually quite entertaining. <coughs> it's, it's kind of like going to a play and a dance at the same time. So I think you'll have a great time. And then the last thing that I wanted to tell you is that I know we're not the visitor center anymore. We were for 55 years. We kind of miss it. But we were asked a lot about maps for the Comox Valley, and there was not an official map of the Comox Valley. So we went back 
to our original map format, which is uh, a fundraiser for uh, Ground Search and Rescue. So they did all the um, map tracking. They went out and added all the new subdivisions, because the last map we did was 2009, I believe, so a lot of things have changed in 10 years. Yeah, a lot of things. And so we now have a Comox Valley map again, and they're $5. We sell them to the visitor center, buy the box. We sell them to realtors, uh, you know, delivery companies, couriers, that kind of thing. And the people like the map because they have no advertising. So we had a lot of offers for people to buy pages or put advertising, but that wasn't the goal of the map. The goal was to make it easy for people to follow. So on one side, it's rural, all, so it goes all the way out to you know this side of Oyster River to this side of Bowser. So all the rural areas are mapped out, as well as Courtney, Comox, and Cumberland. And we sell them for five dollars, including your tax. So you come in, give us five dollars, and we'll hand you a map. So yeah, we're quite we're quite proud of this project, and it, it helps ground search and rescue. So everyone wins. Um, I think I said this at the regional district, it was kind of funny because we were out there for our barbecue and the ground search and rescue guys arrived by helicopter. It wasn't on purpose, it just happened. And we've been talking about the map and in they came and we thought, well, that's why we have the map, is because we want to help support our community. So anything that we can do to help support our community. The chamber is not government funded, we are a completely membership driven organization and we survive on our events and our membership fees. So that's how that's how we keep going. And we've been around for 100 years, and we plan to be around for a lot longer. And if you don't know where we are, we're on Cliff Avenue, right beside the steam train, the old Comox logging steam train that every kid in the valley comes to get a key to so they can play on it. <laughs> so if you have grandkids and things, they really love the train, and you can ring the bell as well. Well, so you can get right in there. You can get right in there. So uh, we have a key to the cage, and uh, we've had train, uh, train buffs come and, and get their photos taken with the train. And So yes, the train is there for people to have a look at. And that's my presentation. Great. Thank you very much. You're just welcome. a question to the CIA. We, we don't need a motion for the proclamation, do we? We can just... Uh, if, uh, if council is unanimous on wanting to make a proclamation, yeah. we can do that right now. Yes. Yeah. Sure. That. That. So any questions about the proclamation? Wording we can get from you. I can give you what the regional district yeah. wrote. I thought, you know, if you had a cheat sheet in my house. <laughs> I don't believe in reinventing the yeah. wheel. Maybe you can just hand that to Twyla okay, there sure. when you're done. So, okay, so all in favor of the proclamation? There you go. So that's done. Uh, any questions for uh, Diane? So she's up there. Well, seeing none, thank you very much, Thanks Diane, so. and we'll get that going for you. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so now we have uh, Angela Holmes from uh, Learnings from the Active Transport Summit. Angela. Angela. Yeah, there you are. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Welcome, Angela. Thank you. Have ten minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, so thank you for slipping me in for a delegation this evening. I really appreciate speaking to the councillors. Um, so I had the pleasure of attending uh, the BC Active Transportation Summit, and that was held over in New Westminster in June, uh, middle of June. I'll just get the slides to catch up. Uh, it was an invitation uh, that the Cycling Coalition made. They wanted somebody to attend the summit on their behalf. So I had the pleasure of a going. Um, and the summit itself has been running for quite some time. Is that the forward button? There we go. The organization that held the summit is the British Columbia Cycling Coalition. And currently they have 70,000 members. Um, the, their main mission right now is to really encourage uh, the BC government to invest up to $1 billion in cycling infrastructure over the next 10 years. They're very interested in completing networks and upgrading bridges and highways. Interestingly enough, some of the major sponsors were the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure, uh, McElhaney and Urban Systems, all three businesses and ministries are here in the Comox Valley. I know Urban Systems does a lot of work for uh, the City of Courtney. 
I have a, a video of the summit, but I think I'll pass it in, in the efforts to get through your next few well, If you, if you would like to uh, have it out there for council, feel free. Actually, how do we go ahead and play it? <laughs> <laughs> So this just gives you an idea of the caliber of the summit. Um, <laughs>
the summit was really about inclusivity. How can we make our transportation accessible for everyone? So not just cyclists, and I'm not up here just representing cyclists, but <coughs> everyone. So that's that eight-year-old to the 80-year-old category. And really it's about um, looking at things from a place of equity and making sure that everybody has that right to safe mobility. And it's a real kind of paradigm shift that I personally went through as a conference attendee there as well. It really was able to expand my own um, experience about what inclusivity was. Um, some of the groups that were there really felt that putting human beings is the key to transportation, solving tra transportation issues. Let's put the human beings back into the picture. That was a quote from Elder Ruth. So as far as the time to Comox goes, you have an awesome operations strategy. I had a chance to have Shelley Ashfield um, come and do a presentation, and I was sitting at the table, and I left that presentation going, man, I wish I lived in Comox. Like, mm -hmm. There's a lot of really great things going on here that tied back to transportation and what's happening um, as a province. Um, look forward to funding coming up through the climate change grants that will be happening through the Active Transportation Strategy and Clean BC Strategy. Uh, the Regional Transportation Strategy is an initiative that's starting here, um, actually through our parks departments, are now talking to each other about let's, let's get out of our silos, let's get this Regional Transportation Plan happening. And Shelley is working locally with NGOs on um, reviewing the Comox Transportation Plan, all leading to your goals of GHG reductions. Uh, Vision Zero, I'm not sure if you've heard that concept before, but it's really, um, it's, it's incredible. It's really about prioritizing the safe passage of our most vulnerable populations that are walking, cycling, or using um, any light mobility devices. So that safe passage is again shifting our thinking around let's not build for the vehicle, but let's build for human beings and all their ways that we move. Um, so I'm, I'm just here to share that message. And how that fits back into current pedestrian network that we have in place as well as the bike and greenways network. Um, in addition, there was the active transportation strategy was launched um, at the summit, and that strategy is out of uh, Clean BC. So that's an initiative to, in 2030, have um, reduced our greenhouse gas emissions. Now, part of the plan that the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure has is to help in that initiative by actually doubling the percentage of active transportation trips that are normally taken in an area. And going by a study that was done here in Comox in 2010, it's about 17% of the people here in Comox are riding a bike two times a week. So if we could, I'll put a challenge out to the town of Comox is to double that percentage um, to four times a week, or 34%. <coughs> Oh, I have my timer set for 10 minutes. So I'm going to speed it up a little bit. <laughs> I don't like to startle anybody. Um, so the active transportation strategy is online. I have a paper version here. I'm happy to, to leave with Twyla if anybody wants to have a look. And the other area where there was some direct links to the town of Comox was around this idea that transportation can actually be a an area of reconciliation with our own Comox First Nation. And that was really a new thought to me too. I sit on the Integrated Regional Transportation Select Committee, and at that committee we've been really struggling with putting a multimodal use path along Comox Bank Road. But here it was, where it was Elder Ruth herself was saying, let's get back to putting human beings back in the picture, let's get back to being good to our neighbors. So um, it is possible, it's taken her 20 years to complete this great Blue Heron Way. Um, and then this is some other quick learning links that I made from the summit. Um, education is really important to help change our culture. The Vancouver School Board and the City of Vancouver, they meet once a month just to discuss school travel planning alone. And the bike <coughs> business is, oh, um, uh, 
sorry, I've forgotten her name, Diane's not here anymore, but there is a bike and business working group in Vancouver um, that also meets regularly with the City of Vancouver and MOTI. And plus, there's a new active transportation design guide that's been released. So there's some really cool initiatives going on, and I just wanted to bring it back and say thank you to the town of Comox. Um, really appreciate the work that is being done. And um, it's also um, happening at a provincial level, too. So I think we're, uh, we're part of the movement. <coughs> it's very cool. And that's it for me. Thank you very much. Any <laughs> questions from council? Seeing none, thank you very much for your presentation. Okay, thank Appreciate you. It. Okay, so uh, now we're on to the uh, uh, later delegations. Peter, Peter uh, Dobbs. Yeah, Peter, take the podium. And um, you have 10 minutes. Councillors, I'm uh, here to um, talk about the pros and cons of the Canada store and the application on Church Street. Um, our families lived here for 50 odd years, 60 years actually, on the same location in Lower Vista Avenue. Um, the, the location of the Canada store is surrounded by teenagers. Three on one side, two on the other. I'm not going to go into the pros and cons of cannabis because it's not my point, it's legal, but we do have a problem where we live right now. The huge big problem, of course, is the parking. As some of you are aware, um, we've attended uh, functions at the new tap house, um, the uh, parking is, there was no allocation for it, and we are suffering because of it. And with the cannabis store going in, it's it's already insufferable uh, and it's going to make it another work would be unbearable. Anyway, we are not in favor of it. We have um, uh, we had notices sent out to people, um, uh, the town's uh, notices out to people living within 80 meters of the cannabis store and um, the letters that were sent and also letters were submitted into the town hall. And out of those letters that we returned, uh, 42 written, there were 17 in favor of the cannabis store and 25 were against the cannabis store, 63% as opposed to 37%. Um, so two, two to one, the, uh, the people in the neighborhood are not in favor of this cannabis store. I went around in the last few days to residents within a hundred meters of the cannabis store and I found that we had um, 38 of the people we visited were against the store. I have their names and signatures here on this uh, little form are made up, and only four declined to sign. So these are people who are living within 100 meters of the cannabis store. So all in all, what I'm trying to say in short, because we're right now the time, is the residents in the immediate area are not in favor of this cannabis store, um, because of the, mainly because of the parking problems. We also have uh, a few other problems, but um, One other one I was going to say. Oh, yes, the other thing, the, the, the second thing that I got from going around to the residents was, do we need two stores in Comox? That was a resounding question we had. Why do we need, need two stores where there's one in the mall? Um, I understand the initial um, feedback was no stores should be within 200 meters of each other. Well, these two stores are 207 meters. I don't know. If you want to go get the cannabis, the mall has one for time. We have none. So I suggest to the council um, maybe we should consider a nay rather than a yay because of the feelings of the local residents, many of whom have been here 
all their lives. I mean, it's already been disrupted because of the local business of the broken up of the bakery and the tap house. And with this included, I don't know what it's going to be. Thank you for your time. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to try and answer them to the best of my ability. Thank you, sir. Um, <coughs> Council, have any questions for Mr. Dobbs? One, the council Yes, yeah, so if the parking was taken care of, you wouldn't have as much of an issue with it? If that is the main issue, yeah. yeah. But how would that sort of thing happen? Unless you buy a lot and turn into a parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> representing him in, uh, uh, from the immediate neighborhood who would like to have it. Well, we're, we're, we've already really extended, um, you I'll know. Chuck, cut my name. Here, here was under five minutes. I think it's okay. You think it's okay? <laughs> well, maybe we should ask counsel. I was so. quick. Yeah. Um, all right, sir, if you have a, a minute or two, you can, you can speak, but we, we do have to move this forward. Mr. Mayor, I want to thank you for that. I really do appreciate it, and uh, honorable uh, elected members of council. Um, many of you who, uh, I must say, uh, absolutely do a fantastic job. Um, there was a couple things that I would say, and, and uh, I will, uh, to answer your question, I couldn't care less about the parking. <laughs> okay. The parking is terrible. It's always been terrible. Um, the pub is not going to help with it, but it's then it's not great. But here's, here's just, a, here's just a, an iota of a few things that you guys should consider in thinking about diversifying your tax base. Uh, having two, can we just call them pot stores? Is that okay? Uh, the cannabis store. Yeah. That's yeah. illegal. Can we? Okay. Uh, because they put a single use of plastic around it, that's really hard to open. It becomes cannabis. But before, it was always pot. Um, and I'm from Nelson, BC. I am not in any way, shape, or form against legalized cannabis. Thank you. Uh, you can't be if you come from Nelson, BC. Just the decision to put it on the church street. And just, just from tonight, um, I would like to uh, just say John Bowman did a great job showing the NIC vision for the future 2020. The very first time, and I'm the person that directly abuts this potential business, the very first time I heard about this was three weeks ago. Nobody has talked to me about this business going on. I have two kids, 11 and 16. Right next door to us are teenagers, right across the way. Up the, up the street are all teenagers. I do not speak for the neighborhood, but I've spoken with most of the neighborhood. They are very much against this. Um, um, I would also mention that the Chamber of Commerce is turning 100. I love that speech done by Diane. And, uh, you know, I, it, was re it reminded me that a business in Courtney was unable to get a license. Leave. And the reason for it was strictly because the businesses around me did not want them there because of the potential uh, harm of uh, the smell. Basically, that's what it came down to. That's the, that's the reason that it, that it came down to. Now, the other businesses that are on Church Street probably won't take issue with potential cannabis uh, uh, sales. There aren't that many businesses on, on uh, Church Street, but the people that live there do. The active transportation summit uh, that she brought up Talking about the Raw Grove Corridor, Church Street is a part of that corridor. I, I, maybe it's just me, but I'm not proud of a town that, has, that needs or desires, given our population, to legalize campus stores. We don't need them. Well, we the definitely the don't zoning need allows them. for three of the town of Comox. Uh, this was all, you know, not to interrupt you, but this was all gone through. Uh, Hearings, uh, what was it? Mr. Mayor, you can also you can also put a you mm -hmm. can you can legally put a casino mm -hmm. uh, in the church or around the church if you do so desire. Mm -hmm. And soon they will legalize profits if you would like to put that in there as well. Okay, yeah, not against legalized cannabis. I am completely just against this one location. I'm the mall. I'm fine with because like the other point I will make is that they will have to have a sign in there that says. Weed and alcohol do not mix. They, that's one of the signs, of the, of the four signs that they will have to put up as a notice for everybody. It is going to be right beside a pub. And it's going to be open until 10. 
the likelihood of that working out well for our town is not good. Please consider our voice. <coughs> we have given you our voice. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And uh, council have any questions? Sarah, can, oh, can I just get your name just for, for our... My name is our, Jason Heppen. Jason. I live at 1809 Winnipeg Avenue. Okay, I have one. Yeah, so, so uh, Councillor McKinnon has a question. Heffern. 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 Yeah, Heffern. Have you been inside uh, a cannabis store? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Were your concerns uh, about, because uh, I've been in 20 of them across the country, yeah. just as I've done research, as I've seen them come in legalization and seen them come into town. Um, the, most recently, there's one in Campbell River that opened. Yes. You cannot, the, the aroma, is gone. You can't smell it. Uh, you cannot. That is very true because yeah. they're all wrapped in very hard to get at uh, individual plastics. Well, um, they are the, the packaging yeah, the is, is, is something different. And you're not allowed to smoke it there. <clears throat> very true. Correct. Um, and so they've eliminated virtually aroma. Uh, stepping outside, I think, is more of a bigger concern for the resident. Yeah. It's not the concern of, of, of I'm just a clarity question. Sure. Is, uh, Aroma coming from the, the the business is not a concern. You know, it's actually the likelihood of it being smoked outside the pub. That's actually a bit right. Of a concern. So my so what prohibits people from shopping anywhere for cannabis and smoking it anywhere in Coma? Aside from bylaws, yeah, ease, right? And, and ease, uh, you know, bylaws. I mean, you have to hold to, but there are specific bylaws and where you can. And you're yeah, absolutely right. right. Yeah, but we can, and actually, a fair point is we can go across the Blue Bridge, yeah. and to any number of different uh, stores, and buy them between the, the hours of nine and six, and use it as we will in, in terms of our consumption. Um, but this particular store is perfectly placed in a place very close to a pub and is going to be open until 10 o'clock at night. I have made some very poor decisions at 9 coming from a pub. Mm -hmm. I would like to interrupt just for a um, moment to ask everyone who is on this board that we have in Como. Okay, so, so, so ma'am, we're not, we're not in a public hearing. We're, we're here to, you know, to no, hear... No, but I want you to understand one thing. Would you have that next door to your home? So, because so, the rest of the I, church, I can answer that. Yeah. So church what, yeah. is there as residential area. And that's the question that sure, I okay. don't think so, you so, are understanding. So, yes, we are understanding it, ma'am. And this process has evolved. Uh, last year, uh, Marvin from planning maybe can put the finer points on, but this has gone through uh, a zoning process and these are areas where this type of business is allowed. So, You're not in so residential areas and I don't that, understand that, that where you are using your common sense on this yeah. one. So, so, for the yeah. simple reason yeah. that you yeah. might have yeah. this Council in Grant, your area. Ahead. If I may ma'am, this is not a discussion no. with, with you. This was a discussion that we allowed yeah. you to come as a delegation as the neighbors. Mr. Haplin got a Extra spot yeah. to come, but this is not the time for debate. At the, at the end, end, at the, okay, at the end, at the end of the meeting, what we do is we allow questions from the public, and if there was media, so we would we would entertain your, your question at the end. But uh, we we do hear all your concerns. Yeah. So, Mr. Kidd, just to your yeah. your question, I, I, it's not it's not the smell of the store or even the idea of, of the of the use of cannabis whatsoever. Um, it's just the opportunity that is likely to be present itself. Uh, gosh, I, was, I, I walked beside the pub to get here, and there were two people smoking. Um, I, I, I came here, I uh, interrupted my camping trip, to, and it smells like a skunk everywhere I go. Um, and so, and we've got kids, and like the little kids were in a group of like 20 people, and I'm like, what's that smell? You know, it, it's, it's like one of those things like, well, I guess we've got to have that, that conversation. That's another, another thing, but I, I hate that we have to have a conversation right there uh, in our backyard. And to the, 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 the planning that you guys did in diversifying your, your tax base, I admire it. I really do. But that said, you didn't ask the constituents. You did have a public hearing. I do remember hearing about the public hearing after it already happened. But you no, did yeah, not yeah. ask your constituents, the ones that are going to be directly affected. Um, I believe uh, to the planner that these did go out to the public. Um, we got a notice. Yeah. That's all we got. Three weeks ago. 
but prior prior to us zoning that area, this went out to the public. As we do with, as you know, a little later we're going to be talking about that we're at that 6:30. We're going to have a public hearing, and, and we've gone past that. Mayor, I, 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 thank, I do thank you for your time and, and uh, your duly elected councillors uh, from the town of Hamilton. I think you've heard our voice. Yes. Um, be wise with this, please. Because there's plenty of other businesses I can go into that with. One further one, if I may. They have to have security cameras all over that thing. I am worried about an infringement of my privacy. I am directly about it. No one has had a conversation with me about this business. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And as Monty Python would say, now for something completely different, we will have... Um, Sheila Rivers from Coast Range Cannabis, who will speak to us. Thank you. Sheila, thank you. Uh, you have 10 minutes. Thank you so much for including me last minute. I appreciate it. So once again, I'm Sheila Rivers, owner and operator of the proposed cannabis store at 221 C Church Street, uh, which is a pre-zone location for non-medical cannabis retail. And I wanted to take this opportunity to review with you just the business standards that I've set and provide a little bit of further insight. So, Coast Range Cannabis will be a boutique store, clearly, it's a small space. We will set standards for retail cannabis on Vancouver Island for high level customer service and education. The design of the store will utilize local products, highlight a marine and mountain theme, and will be welcoming to all demographics. Customer service and education are pillars of our business, so as such, employee compensation will be above Comox Valley's living wage. It's our goal to hire excellent staff that complement each demographic of patron. And from those, for example, that I met at the consultation with St. Peter's Church that use cannabis to aid in sleep, or to those navigating newbies who are trying to look at the local product list, we're there to help. The retail design and space and the local rationale really speak to local culture, and that's because Coast Range will focus on local producers first. So, currently we have four federally licensed producers approved by Health Canada on Vancouver Island. There's 23 in BC. So supporting these producers first not only supports the local economy, but offers local regulated products to everybody. 19 plus. Within the town of Comox, there are over 10,000 residents that are 20 years and older. The average usage cited by Stats Canada is at 20% based on the third quarter of the 2018 stats. Based on this, there is plenty of market share within the area for a minimum of two stores. As noted in the application, our hours are our proposed hours are 9 a.m. to 10 p.m. seven days a week. The hours are set around the neighboring businesses, so the bakery goes from 8 a.m. at latest to 9 p.m. and for the tap house, it's noon to 1 a.m. We're equally sensitive to the unique fact that person-to-person -person preferences for cannabis use depends on time. So basically, people can be taking it morning, midday, or as I mentioned before, at night time to aid in sleep. So our proposed hours allow patrons to shop based on their personal use. With the support of the property owner, 221 Church Street will have a no-smoking policy on his private property. We'll have no-smoking signage throughout the store and the premises. And additionally, BC Cannabis Control and Licensing Act, specific around the laws of where can I, can I not smoke cannabis, will be made available to each patron that comes in. So with full support from the property owner, the parking that we propose is four spots in the rear of 221 Church Street. As the retail space is less than 600 square, 650 square feet, I believe that these four entirely new parking spots will serve all the patrons coming to our location. In fact, it's required just to have one parking spot for this location we are proposing for. So as a Comox resident, I am part of the community, and it's my goal to further its health. We'll set up proceed donation days that support local charities in a meaningful way. And through the above, we will ensure the addition of the store is not disruptive. That Coast Range Cannabis will be a valuable and active part of the community. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any questions from Council? Council Fissinger and then Swift. Yeah, thanks, Sheila. Um, would you be open to changing the proposed hours? Like, is that, are they pretty much set in stone, or would you be 
comparable to closing at 8 p.m. when Church Street closed, like the bakery closed at 8 p.m. I think until Thursday and they opened until 9, Saturday, Sunday, whatever it is. Yeah, I think clearly nothing's said it's done at this point. But I think, um, yeah, ideally we like to stay in at least till 9 o'clock at night. Um, like I mentioned, a lot of people use this for sleep aids. So I would really hate to miss out on people being able to access the store at that time of night. But certainly we're flexible. Uh, Councillor Swift and then McKenna. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, <coughs> we heard the neighbor's concern regarding the um, cameras. And could you address that and or how, how many and location and so on? Yes. Um, so in terms of the cameras, they, the only outside cameras will be available, available at the front and the rear, and none of them are projected out into residential areas at all. It's specifically to keep an eye on the door, who's entering and who's leaving the shop. So, some at the front and then one at the back to control the parking lot. That's correct. <laughs> Basically, at the rear entrance where the deliveries will be made. Thank you. Okay, Councillor McKenna. I, I have the same question. So it's a provincial regulation, the security cameras are entrance and exit. Absolutely, yeah, as well as inside at touch points that we've, uh, so basically the security plan has been sent to the province, and the province has approved it based on what we've identified as areas. We've, we've worked with a local security company to, uh, to create the space for them. And uh, just as a matter of record, yeah, one more yeah, question. Yeah. Um, the owner, David Murray, uh, had an email to council and suggested uh, potentially 15-minute parking spots. Uh, mm -hmm. to alleviate some of that parking strain, mm -hmm. and would you be amenable to something like that? Yeah, I mean, I, we were, I was chatting with David about it today, and we both agreed that it would be, I think, a useful idea um, in terms of alleviating some of that parking pressure, in addition to the four spots that we had proposed as well. Under. And that's something we can propose. But there is only two parking spots at the back of the whole country and cannabis. Yes, yeah, sir. Yeah, sir. Thank you. Uh, we're, 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 we've given you your opportunity now. This is the, um, okay. Any other questions for uh, Ms. Rivers? Seeing none, no. Thank you very much. All right. And I think that's it for delegation. So um, we do have seven minutes. I guess we'll just uh, get through what we can on the agenda before we uh, recess to the public hearing. So um, the next thing we have is minutes of the meetings, uh, regular council meeting minutes for approval. Second. Any questions on that? All in favor? Good. Very. And, uh, Public hearing meetings of uh, July 3rd. Okay, any questions on those? Okay. All in favor? Carried. Okay, thank you. And I'll move the management report from August 7th. All right. Any. Second. Okay, any questions on that? Seeing none, all in favor? Okay. Um, the 2018 annual report. All right. Second. Second. Any questions on that? Seeing none, all in favor? Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I think we'll do with this stuff right So, yes, so uh, what we do, uh, we'll um, a motion to recess for the public hearing. Move. Second. Okay, all in favor? All right, okay. So, uh, we'll, uh, we're a few minutes early. Um, at uh, 18, at 6.30, we'll uh, reconvene and move to the public hearing.